Ever wondered what doctor you should go see if you're considering hormone replacement therapy and what questions you should actually ask that doctor? You're going to want to listen really closely today if this is you. Hello and welcome back to Living a Nutritious Life. I'm your host, Carrie Glassman, and in today's episode, we have the incredible Dr. Kavita Desai joining us to unravel the complexities of brain health and its connection with menopause. If you listen to the podcast or follow me anywhere, you know both of these topics are close to my heart. Dr. Kavita Desai earned her doctorate of pharmacy. She has headed a large teaching hospital pharmacy department, started her own cardiovascular risk factor prevention clinic, and owned a multidisciplinary medical clinic with a pharmacy specializing in pain care, including fibromyalgia. Dr. Desai's experience has underscored the importance of disease prevention and the ongoing struggles that women face in accessing adequate care. She also created the women's health company, Revivel, with the hope of encouraging women to prioritize their health early on and wrote the book, Lady Parts, Putting Women's Health Back into Women's Hands. In today's podcast, Dr. Desai shares why we should not dismiss perimenopausal symptoms as mere inconveniences, but rather as potential indicators of serious health conditions like Alzheimer's disease. We discuss the intricate role that hormones play in cognitive health and why addressing symptoms proactively can have substantial benefits for our future well-being. So tune in and join us today for a truly informative episode and become empowered with knowledge to take command of your brain health and your overall health. And as always, if you like the podcast, please like, comment, and share. Dr. Kavita Desai. It is so nice to see you here. I'm so excited that you are joining us for the podcast today. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me, Carrie. What a pleasure. I'm really excited about this conversation because as we were chatting, I loved the brain health conversation for I think as long as I've been studying nutrition, I've been fascinated with it. My grandmother had Alzheimer's. I've always been interested in being as sharp and focused as possible. So as I've aged, I've become even more interested in it. But the other conversation we're going to have today around perimenopause and menopause is another topic that I think comes up at least... I would say 10 times a day in my world right now with whether it's clients, friends, family members. I mean, it is just the conversation being had. I would say probably most among most amongst my friends. <laughs> it is just a conversation we are all having. I'm going to be 51 soon and that is just yeah, it is a big topic. So Today, we get to talk about both of those things and I'm super excited um, to share also with our listeners about brain health, about menopause, and about how those two things intersect and what we can do to maximize our brain health, minimize menopause symptoms, and age the best we possibly can. So let's dive into all of this. Great. So I want to actually ask you a question right off the top. What is one thing about menopause and brain health that you think most women or most people in general have no idea about or would be really surprised to learn? So I think the biggest thing for me, um, and these are also two of my favorite topics, so I'm glad that we're talking about them today. Um, is so it that might be a four-hour podcast. Sorry, everyone. This might be this might be many a long, long time because we're going to have lots to talk about. Okay, sorry. Go on. Yes, um, is that I think we don't realize, we talk a lot about perimenopause, the symptoms that we experience. We're telling women to embrace that you know stage of their life. We want to reduce the stigma. But for me, it goes... A layer deeper than that, that yes, we should be doing all of that. I think we need to be talking about it to address it. Mm -hmm. But the symptoms we experience are not just symptoms, they're also risk factors. And I think that's what women mm -hmm. don't realize. And that's what I'm trying to really shed light on. And I want women to be aware of that it's these symptoms can actually lead to very serious illnesses. And one of them happens to be Alzheimer's. A, num a number of the symptoms that we start to experience during our perimenopausal years are actually the exact same risk factors that we know could lead to Alzheimer's. And I think that's the correlation that needs to be made and we need to be addressing them much more seriously, not just embracing it. 
Yeah, it is such a good point that you're bringing up because I think so many people, they think, okay, so I get some hot flashes and I'm moody and I'm tired and I'm a little brain foggy, but they, they kind of feel like, ah, I can fight through it. It's not that bad. I'm managing it. I'm dealing with it. And they just yep. think that A, they're being heroes and B, if they can get through it, then they'll get through it and they'll get through this phase and all will be okay. But I think, I think we also it's what we've been told for generations, right? Correct. Like I know my mom's generation, they were just told to suck it up and endure it. And it's a natural part of life. And we didn't really look at it any differently than that. Absolutely. Right. So then we think, okay, so we get through that and we manage it. And not only have we been heroes, but hey, we're now through it. Life's good. <laughs> but what, what they don't realize, what you just pointed out, which I think is so important is that all of those things that you were feeling were signs from, mm -hmm. they were signs from your body telling you that you are at risk for things in the future. So I kind of, what I've said to people, and I, and I feel like you'll probably be on the same page here, is that those risk factors, you're kind of, you're kind of lucky, sorry, those symptoms, you're kind of lucky when you have some of those symptoms, when you have those symptoms of, let's say, hot flashes, or when you have a symptom of feeling irritable, cranky, tired, brain foggy, because then you're made aware of it and you know mm -hmm. you know that you're going through that and so maybe you take action. So you're more yeah. likely, yes, there are some people that will just be heroes and try to fight through it, but there are people that will take action. At least is like, a, it's like a big, you know, it's like a big, you know, light bulb, <laughs> like, hey, or a big, uh, I should say like, you know, street sign, like stop right <laughs> here, what's happening, take a look at it and yeah. take some action. So if you yeah. don't feel any symptoms, you're not necessarily being at, you won't necessarily be as proactive in, right. you know, in, in changing your health for the future, which is, yeah. by the way, another question I have though, because I think this comes up a lot. If someone doesn't have symptoms, are they mm -hmm. at less risk for, let's say, let's just use the brain fog and Alzheimer's. So no. if you don't have the symptoms of brain fog when you're perimenopausal, menopausal, are you at less risk for Alzheimer's? No, because if you think about it, what does estrogen and progesterone do in our body, right? It's very protective. We have estrogen receptors in our brain, which help, you know, modulate our glucose levels. It helps with mood and, you know, we don't even know it entirely, the, like everything that estrogen does within our body, but we know it's, it's significant, which is why we end up with these symptoms. Um, and a lot of times the symptoms are things that we don't even correlate with perimenopause. So suddenly we're in our forties and we're not sleeping as well. Well, we don't think of that as a symptom. We're just like, oh, I didn't sleep very well, but that's, that's because of the loss of estrogen and progesterone and poor sleep is linked with numerous chronic diseases, Alzheimer's included, right? They were doing right. studies on it. That if you're not sleeping well, then you're at significant risk of cognitive decline. Um, we end up with gut disturbances, which again, if you're just not digesting something well, you can't tolerate spicy food anymore. We don't think of that as a gut microbiome disbalance. And we know that there's a gut brain connection. So again, I think hot flashes are just the tip of the iceberg. And those are the, Correct. you know, waking hair loss, hot flashes. Those are the ones that we generally correlate with perimenopause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there's 35 to 50 more symptoms that we experience that we don't even know, joint pain, inflammation, and all of those things are risk factors. Um, right, right. That we don't so. even know is really happening or we're at least not connecting it to perimenopause. Yeah. So, but would you say, let's just say hypothetically, there's someone out there, they're not having any joint pain, they're sleeping great, they're not having any weight gain, they're not feeling brain foggy. Would you say they're at less risk for Alzheimer's in the future? We don't know that though, right? right. Because we right. don't know the exact cause of Alzheimer's. So okay. I would say the loss of estrogen alone is already a risk factor, regardless okay. if you're feeling the right. other symptoms or not. Right. And because we don't know the cause of Alzheimer's, we also can't say that you won't get it. Right. right. We don't know. We don't know what that magic bullet is. So I'm a big advocate of addressing everything, whether you think you need to or not. Absolutely. I'm, I'm totally with you there. I'm, I'm sort of hammering <laughs> down on that and, and asking that question because like I said, I say to people, if you have symptoms, it's almost look at it as again, a little bit of a blessing a that edge. it's like, yeah. again, it's that sign in front of you saying, Hey, address these things. So, yes. because so many other people, when they don't have those things, they just kind of, again, they go, they just kind of plow through it. Or again, they I even have the symptoms. Though, I would be, it would be hard. I think we'd be hard pressed though to find a woman that doesn't have any symptoms. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think. 
I agree, but maybe I think not there's a... your typical ones, like maybe not hot flashes necessarily. Yeah. Um, but I don't know too many women that say they're still sleeping well or they don't feel fatigued or they aren't having aches and pains that they didn't have before. Um, mood, even if it's mild, but mood yeah. disorders increase anxiety. But I do think there's a wide range. I mean, I do think there's a wide range. I do think that there are people that say like, I can't get through the night without, you know, changing my clothes three times, or I have to even change the sheets. I'm soaking through, you know, I'm I'm dripping sweat. And then, I mean, I know I've never had a hot flash. I'm not in, I'm not menopausal yet. And I'm, but I'm in that peri stage. I'm 51. Mm -hmm. And I certainly feel like I get some brain fog. I get, I definitely get irritable. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> ask my boyfriend. I get irritable. Ask my kids. Um, yeah, no, so there are, too. so there's definitely things happening there, but I don't have some of those stereotypical ones perhaps. No. And I, and I don't, and yeah. I don't think that's different so, for everyone. Yeah, it yeah. is. It is definitely different. Anyway, I just wanted to make, I guess that point, which we've now made, yeah. whether you have these, the stereotypical symptoms, whether you have other symptoms or whether you don't even think you have any symptoms, there are things going on (laughs) and there are things happening to your body as estrogen is decreasing and your hormones are changing. And we all need to be proactive to optimize our health for the future. That's right. And I think that's a really empowering thing though, because Mm -hmm. I think when we think about it like that, like there's so much we know now, like you said, there's a lot we still don't know right? We, like you mentioned, we don't know exactly how, why Alzheimer's happens. We don't know. There's a lot of things in medicine and, and, you know, we don't know, but there's a lot we do know now. And there's a lot of ways we can be proactive to, again, age better and Mm -hmm. feel, feel better and, and be happier and be, again, when it comes to brain health, be more focused, be more clear, have better cognition as we age. I want to dive into that, but before we go into Alzheimer's a little bit more and the connection between menopause and, and brain health. I want to ask you, why do you think menopause hasn't been discussed in a mainstream way for many years? I think because even today, we haven't really made that correlation in medicine between the loss of our hormones and disease risk, right? We know it happens. We know that women are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease and osteoporosis and numerous like fibromyalgia and all these other and other anti or inflammatory diseases. But we don't, we haven't made it a syndrome, right? We treat it symptomatically. So if a woman comes in and says, oh, I'm feeling very anxious, then she's given an antidepressant Mm -hmm. or I'm not sleeping well, she's given a sleep aid. But we're not looking at menopause as a syndrome. And I feel like, I mean, it's a bit of a gender disparity. I think, you know, for Mm -hmm. decades, women's health was just not a priority, even though we're half the population, we're living longer. So, you know, we're living into years where at this point we would have been dying generations ago, right? Mm -hmm. In our 50s. So now we're trying to live much longer, which means we now have to start addressing this the same way we would when we start to lose, you know, our insulin function. If you're diabetic, we replace your insulin. So the same way when we start to lose our estrogen progesterone, which, you know, leads to so many so many like losses of function in our body and dry skin and, you know, genitourinary symptoms and hair mm-hmm. loss and, weight gain and, you know, the gamut of it. We need to start replacing those hormones or at least supporting them. Right? making lifestyle changes to circumvent some of the risk factors that start to exist. Yeah, it's such a good point about living longer. Like, and and people, you know, when the topic of HRT comes up, which I think mm-hmm. you know, there's been a big shift we know in recent yeah. years in terms yeah. of the recommendations for HRT. I'm a big fan of HRT for mm-hmm. the large majority of people. Certainly not necessarily right for every single person, but I do think it's right for many, many people. Uh, But we know for many years, and especially I know my mother's generation, they were all told not to go on HRT. But it's such an important point. I mean, we're living longer and these, like, we we used our, these hormones used to decrease and shift and change, but then we would die right now. I mean, if we want to live again, energetically, optimally feel good and, 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 you know, feel good as we age, we, we have to have these hormones. I think the insulin example that you just gave was perfect. So actually, yeah. before we dive into Alzheimer's, let's, let's talk about HRT a little bit right now, because um, we just, we just started that conversation. I think it's a good direction to go in because I think, and, and also I'll circle this back to the topic of women's health and menopause, which hasn't been talked about a lot. I think something else when it comes to HRT and going to your healthcare practitioner and 
when you go to the doctor, I think many people don't know what to ask. And so mm-hmm. let's start with that as, it, as far as HRT goes. I think there are many people now that know, okay, so I'm hearing all this talk about HRT. I'm hearing that it's now a good thing, not a bad thing. I think like the average person out there, like that, that's sometimes the extent of their knowledge about it. So they go yeah. to the doctor. One, I think they don't necessarily know what doctor to go to. They're like, am I going to my OBGYN who delivered my babies? Am I going to a, what's a functional doctor? Is that who I'm going to? Am I going to a functional gynecologist? Am I going to my endocrinologist? Who am I going to? I think that's one question people have. And then I think the next question is when they ask their doctor, whoever they end up going to about HRT, I don't think a lot of women know the questions to ask. So then they're, they don't feel fully empowered and they're kind of just going with whatever the doctor tells them. And obviously mm-hmm. there are some people that are that are more knowledgeable that have done more research than others. But I think mm-hmm. it's just, you know, and especially women at this age, we're busy. We've got a lot of things going on. I mean, for you and I, yeah. these are things we talk about and live and breathe every day. But for the average yeah. person that might be caring for elderly parents, might have teenagers, might be, mm-hmm. you know, working and doing a million different things, they're not necessarily becoming HRT experts. So no. yeah. who should they go see? Or who do you who do you suggest seeing first? And then also, what are the best questions to ask to figure out if it's right for you? Yeah, so this is the conundrum because I think in an ideal world, you would go to your gynecologist, right? That's somebody mm-hmm. that should be very well versed in women's health, can also do all of the other extra testing that we need to be getting done, like our mammogram and our pap mm-hmm. smears. And- So you can be getting total women's care. The problem right now is that there are even gynecologists who currently do not believe in hormone replacement. And there's still a lot of that old rhetoric going around where it causes cancer and it's going to give you blood clots and it's dangerous. And I have friends, patients, you know, acquaintances who all say the same thing that they tried and they were turned down. And they said, unless you're trying to get pregnant, we don't deal with hormones. Like they've literally been told that. So I think it's not so much which specialist you're going to is do they specialize in women's health? And that's what you need to be looking for. So yes, whether it's a functional medicine practitioner, an internist, an endocrinologist, a gynecologist, your family doc, it doesn't matter, but they have to be somebody well-versed in hormone replacement. And that's not a lot of people right now. Yeah, that's generally that's generally been my recommendation to to people who've yeah. asked me about that. So I, I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that's your answer because that's yeah. what I say. It's really about the person and are they mm-hmm. an expert in this area? Yes. And and I've also because had if they're people, not, yeah, if they're not, you can ask them all the right questions and you're going to get the wrong answers. So right, right, absolutely. Right? Well, yeah, so, I mean, I had a friend say that her doctor. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure who the doctor was, but I know that her doctor said to her, you're not having any of these symptoms. You don't need, there's no reason for HRT. And I said, well, that's not Mm -hmm. necessarily true. (laughs) I think you need to go to someone who specializes in this, but that's, but that to me is kind of a common response from many doctors still. Yes. It's very common. Um, I have a friend who lives in North Carolina who said that I think there's maybe five practitioners that she could find in the entire state that prescribes hormone replacement. And that's wow. not very many people in a state that's what the third or fourth mo- most populous in the US, right? So that's very scary that there's not enough. Yeah. I think, um, it, you know, women will not have access to enough of this kind of care. But I think if you want to be armed with the right questions, it's knowing whether you have a contraindication and the mm-hmm. contraindications are not what we once thought. It's not a family history of breast cancer or a family history of blood clots. It's now personal history. Do you yourself have a history of breast cancer? If mm-hmm. not, you are most certainly welcome to take it or try it or at least have the discussion about it. Mm-hmm. And then we want to make sure we're using the newer formulations, right? So we want the topical estradiol. So anything that comes in a patch, cream, gel, um, and is being applied on the skin and Progesterone is usually the micronized version, and that's oral. And that dosing doesn't really change for anyone. As long as you've had a uterus, you generally should be on progesterone with your estrogen. Um, and it's usually taken cyclically. If you still have a cycle, if you have stopped, if your period has stopped, then you would just take a low dose every day. But that it's fairly standard. It's so easy to use, and it can make a remarkable di- difference, not only in symptoms, but in long-term disease risk. 
reduction. Yeah, so, right? Yeah, so that's what I let's talk about that because I, I know some people that are listening are probably thinking, okay, so yeah, I've heard about HRT. I know they used to, again, it wasn't recommended. Now it's recommended by some mm-hmm. people. That's sort of the chatter happening. Okay, I'll ask about it, but why am I asking about it? What's it going to do for me? <laughs> so, yeah. what, so let, let's talk about that. Why, why HRT? Yeah, so not mostly it's usually started when you're having symptoms, right? So, whether you're like if you're having hot flashes, it's really the only indicated. Um, treatment for hot flashes that will definitely help, um, you know, for dry skin and, you know, genital urinary symptoms. If you use topical estradiol, um, it can help with, you know, incontinence and vaginal dryness. And there, so it can help not only with the symptoms that we experience, mood disorders, um, all of that stuff, but we also know that by we're starting to replace our estrogen, we are now protecting ourselves from osteoporosis because as we lose estrogen, we lose bone mass, bone mineral mm-hmm, mass, mm-hmm. and muscle mass. And so by replacing these things, we start sleeping better, which is a risk factor for chronic disease and a symptom. Um, Mm -hmm. We start to improve our gut microbiome. We start to improve our bone health. You know, there's so many reasons, you know, protect your brain. So it's not just symptom relief. And I think that's what I really want women to know is that it's something we should be on starting as early as possible shows better outcomes and staying on it as long as you want. It's not something you stop just because you hit menopause. It's something you can continue well into your 50s, 60s. Right. Well, and that's what I was mentioning about my friend who said, well, she's not having bad symptoms. But I said, but there's all, but there are other reasons. There's preventative Mm -hmm. reasons that you might want to be on it. Did you have a whole conversation about your individual medical history? Like Mm -hmm. you just mentioned, osteoporosis, brain health in the future. So let's, let's actually, let's talk about, let's talk about that now. Let's talk about um, Alzheimer's. So, you know, we hear so much about breast cancer when it comes to women, right? We, we, I feel like we hear about breast cancer all the time, which is by the way, great that we hear a lot about it. And it's great that that it gets a lot of attention that, that is good. But I believe, I think it's in this, I think it's in the sixties, not the fifties. I think women in their sixties are twice as likely to get Alzheimer's than they are breast cancer. And we don't, hear about it. And Mm -hmm. I don't think we hear about it enough. It's not talked about enough. And certainly what we can do to prevent it is not discussed enough. And and as we've been talking about, there is this big link to our loss in estrogen and estrogen receptors in the brain. So can you dive in and talk a little bit about um, why it might not be talked about a lot? And then also what you think are the best things we can do Uh, obviously we just talked a little bit about HRT, but let's talk about HRT and what else can we do to prevent Alzheimer's in the future when we are at this critical stage of life? Yeah. So Alzheimer's definitely affects women more than men. Um, As I've mentioned, we don't know the cause of it. My mom actually had early onset Alzheimer's and I feel like we're not fearful of it unless it's touched you somehow. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mm -hmm. really motivated for me to watch a woman with what I thought was no, who had no risk factor. She led a fairly healthy lifestyle. She didn't have any other chronic illnesses. Um, She was only in her fifties when her symptoms started, but she was also perimenopausal at that time. So a lot of her early symptoms mirrored um, perimenopause. So Mm -hmm. it was initially personality changes. It was not memory, memory loss that I noticed. It was just, she was a little bit grumpier. Right. And that is a lot of women at this stage, we get irritable. Um, So it wasn't obvious to us until much later that she was starting to obviously lose other function um, as it progressed. But I think this is this is the problem is that if it's starting to happen earlier and earlier in women, it is overlapping with perimenopause and you know, I know anyone that has a family history of it is very concerned about their brain health, but I think we all need to be. And there's so many things that are different about the way we live our life now compared to generations past that are going to impact our brain. Mm -hmm. We can't, we can't avoid it. Whether it's, you know, the number of toxins that are around us in our groundwater, in our soil, in the air, Um, our diet obviously is not nearly as healthy or as clean as it once was in years past. We're much more stressed. Um, We spend a lot of times in a time in front of like devices and computers and we're just we're not a healthy population anymore we, we're we're becoming increasingly sick the incidence of alzheimer's is exponentially rising like the the that, I mean, millions of people that they're predicting are going to have alzheimer's in the next 20 to 30 years is it's astounding and frightening and i think as women going through perimenopause we're at an even increased risk now of developing this so i think it, it's in our best interest to start addressing our lifestyle as you know as a 
full unit, right? We have to address everything because I think if we're not looking at all the risk factors, we don't know which one actually, which is the magic bullet for causing these diseases. So you almost have to address everything. Um, and I like to kind of liken it to like the hull of a ship, that if we're a ship and our risk factors are holes in the hull of that boat, if you only plug one or two of those holes or address one or two risk factors, you'll stay afloat, but not for very long. Whereas if you address all your risk factors, you're much, much more likely to stave off disease. So I think, you know, that means looking at everything, starting from diet, which is probably the key, right? Is mm -hmm. trying to reduce your glycemic load because we know they call Alzheimer's type three diabetes. That right. the way right. body, the way our brain processes sugars in Alzheimer's is very different than a normal healthy brain. Um, but we also become a little bit glucose intolerant during our perimenopausal right. years. We don't process sugars the same. So for whether it's for your perimenopausal health or for your brain health, either way, you're addressing the same risk factors, cardiovascular disease, same right, thing, right? Right. Well, so well that's, we have, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say that if you're addressing some of these issues, you're going to, regardless if you were going to get Alzheimer's or not, you're improving your health. Right. So right. if you're if you're addressing blood sugar and managing blood sugar, yes, that's going to help reduce the chances of getting Alzheimer's in the future. However, it's also going to be good for you for various other reasons. Right. So yeah, there is there's system. many there's many reasons yeah. to address all of these different lifestyle habits from from diet to sleep. Right. All yeah. of these things were going to improve our overall health. Um, yeah. in addition to reducing our risk for Alzheimer's. So there's lots of reasons and people should feel very motivated to address these lifestyle habits because yeah. there's, again, there's many, there's many benefits in the future. Yeah. Cause even if you just look at it, will I just feel better today? Yes. 100%. So even if you're not worried about your long-term disease risk, right? like your day-to-day -day life will improve significantly and that should be motivation in itself. Yeah, absolutely. I want to ask you a question about you were saying how when you started talking about Alzheimer's and, and you know, some of the, the you mentioned sometimes it might with your mom, I think you said it was personality change. Mm -hmm. How do you know if 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 you're feeling, let's say, a little less sharp, you're you know, you're walking into the room, the typical walk into a room, forget why you walked into the room type of <laughs> type of scenario. Yeah. If if you're experiencing that, how do you know if it's normal aging? Because there is normal brain aging. Some of it is mm -hmm. normal. Yeah. Right. And that's OK. We're all aging. Right. We yeah. all. And it's a good thing to age. Yeah. Uh, how do you know if it's that? How do you know if it's perimenopause or how do you know if you are already in these early stages of whether it's Alzheimer or some other brain condition? Yeah. So usually for for if it's something more serious, it's going to be functionality that is not normal to mm -hmm. not have. Right. So when we walk into a room and we forget why we're there, I mean, that's not an abnormal thing to happen. I think mm -hmm. that happens to all of us, right? I, you'd be hard pressed to find someone that doesn't experience that once in a while. Um, but it's tell, when, tell my daughter that who makes fun of me all the time. I know. I know they I'll, don't realize that we're all aging at some point, right? <laughs> I, I say that all the time. She'll say, do you know you were just yeah. telling me something and you stopped the middle of your sentence and then you forgot what you were saying? And I was like, well, I, I was doing or thinking three things at one time. That's I'm sorry. Thing. We're all so preoccupied, right? <laughs> right? I know. We're multitasking. And so, I mean, yeah, those kinds of things are going to happen. I mean, I think yeah. that's too, that can't be avoided. But I think it's when you walk into a room and you can't remember what your keys are mm -hmm. or you're the one that normally mm -hmm. pays the bill and you're now starting to forget those functions, right? Mm -hmm. Or you know, you're making a dish like for dinner and that you make all the time and you can't remember the ingredients. So it's when you start forgetting things that are not typical for you to forget or to, you know, to get lost on your normal route to work. You know, those kinds of things is when I think we really, really need to be concerned. If though you're concerned earlier than that, because you might be, you might be someone that's just aware of your own, you know, cognition, then I think it doesn't hurt to see a physician and have a mini mental test done and just to make sure that there isn't something a little bit more serious going on. Um, of course, only an MRI can actually diagnose whether it's Alzheimer's or some other, you know, serious brain disorder that's happening. But I think it it's also a good reason why we shouldn't be just brushing these things off as normal necessarily. And yes, right. brain fog happens to a lot of women. Is it it is, I mean, hormonal, hormonally related, but it's also we're just not sleeping well. So if you improve your sleep hygiene mm -hmm. and that maybe help with your brain fog by changing your diet, by, you know, 
taking lion's mane and trying to take some, you know, um, adaptogenic mm -hmm. uh, stuff, can that maybe help with your brain function? And if that doesn't, and you're still noticing that you're having trouble with, with functionality in life that you normally you wouldn't, then I think it, it's, we need to stop being scared to speak up for ourselves because I think mm -hmm. we do. We're always, oh, then I'm complaining or I'm the one that's, you know, making a big deal out of something. And I think it's okay to go and be concerned about your long-term. Absolutely. And, and it's empowering, right? Like, yeah. like I was saying before, I mean, there's so many things, there are so many things that we do know. So there yes. are so many ways we can take action. Um, mm -hmm. just, you know, you were just mentioning diet and managing your blood sugar and, you know, taking care of your gut health. Let, let's dive in a little further into all of that and talk about some mm -hmm. of these things that we can do to be yeah. proactive. I want to take a moment to tell you about our podcast sponsor, which I'm a super fan of. In today's fast-paced go, go, go world, it's so easy to get overwhelmed and lose focus, especially when you're trying to accomplish critical tasks that require a sharp mind. If you're looking for a way to support your brain health and stay on top of your game, if you know me at all, you know I'm always looking to do that. Well then, you want to know about Cognizant Citicoline. This nutrient helps support brain function and it plays a vital role in nourishing and protecting brain cells. Cognizant Citicoline can help support focus, memory, and attention, promote cognitive performance, and support overall brain health. It's also known for its ability to support brain energy and is backed by numerous studies that show its effectiveness. Whether you're a student, a busy professional, a multitasking parent, or anyone looking to optimize mental clarity and sharpness, adding Cognizant Citicoline to your daily routine can help you achieve those goals and support your brain for the future. It can be found in many different products, including chewables, gummies, beverages, and even cold brew coffee. Visit Cognizant.com for exactly where to find this ingredient, and don't forget to look for Cognizant on the label. To all of that and talk about some of mm -hmm. these things that we can do to be yeah. proactive, to not only go through menopause feeling better, mm -hmm. perimenopause and menopause feeling better, but also to prevent chronic issues in the future. A lot of these risk factors, like, do you want to, like, are you referring to just diet or even things like vitamin D levels, right? We know that the majority of the population probably has low vitamin D levels. That is now linked with chronic diseases, things like cancer and Alzheimer's. And the levels that we need to have are not the, the low clinical levels that we generally will see in practice where, you know, as long as you're in the normal range, they consider that enough. We actually are now seeing that we probably need a lot more vitamin D than we think. So that means not only from diet, but supplementing, because a lot of the time, mm -hmm. so you can't get enough vitamin D in your diet. You may, you may not absorb it. So I'm a big advocate of supplementing for it. You can't be outside to get enough. So I mean, I take supplements in the morning. I have my routine at yeah. night. I'm a big fan of supplements yeah. because like you just mentioned, you can be within normal range and many of your labs, and I think this is something else, you know, I'll have friends that come to me and say, or clients that say, all my labs look totally normal, but just because they're normal doesn't mean they're optimal and doesn't no. mean they're optimal for that individual. Right. You mentioned well, and who decided this indice, right? Like where right. did the normal range even come from? It wasn't, we weren't checking women probably at all that range is probably based on men mm -hmm. and not based on global ethnicities and now we're a very multicultural society right so what's normal for one ethnicity or one gender it may not be the same for somebody else so i think normal is a construct and i think that's yeah. all the more reason why we need to be paying attention to how we actually feel right because that's that's the true indicator Absolutely. And normal isn't necessarily normal for that individual. And it's also right. not necessarily optimal. Right. There can be so not even, getting... with, um, even yeah. the way we dose estrogen, for instance, that, you know, there's that's the other thing you want to be careful that you don't need to be having numerous hormone blood levels done. Right. Especially once you're past 40, we generally say you don't it's tre it's treated based on symptom relief. So if you start using a topical estradiol and you start to feel better, that's the right amount for you. And because my blood level would be very different than somebody else's. What's normal, right? What did I have when I was in my 20s? I don't know. We never would have tested that. So and hormones fluctuate so much. And I think this is why we we need to be taking a much more personalized approach, I think, to medicine. Oh, absolutely. And, and you just brought up another good point. You just mentioned uh, you wouldn't have known you know, what your hormone levels were when you were 20. I say to people all the time, especially with their kids, make sure you get all of the, all of this information and all, mm -hmm. all of the information you possibly can from their doctors, have things tested, get, the, get that lab work done because yeah. they, should, they should have 
those numbers as a frame of reference, you know, yes. when, you know, actually girls, when they're teens, yeah. when they're in their 20s, they should have those numbers again as that frame of reference. So when they, as they age, they can see, you know, what were their, what were their numbers like? And obviously they're going to change, but it's mm -hmm. good to know, just like knowing your medical history, you have to know that, you know, the but more information, the, yeah, exactly. The more information there's going to be, you know, going to be better. Yeah. Other risk factors, things like sleep, right? Str mm -hmm. Reducing stress, activity, right? We don't have to be out there doing hit exercises every day, but we need to be active. We need to be moving and, you know, getting out in nature. And even if it's just walking every single day, I think all of those things are being shown to reduce our risk of numerous chronic diseases. Um, learning new things for Alzheimer's prevention, especially, right? We mm -hmm. want to be the way you exercise your body, we need to be exercising our brain and using it because the less we use it, the more likely it is to become sick. Um, so I think, you know, and then I think as we mentioned, supplementing, because I think we can get a lot from diet, but our food sources are not the same as they once were. Um, soil is nutrient depleted. And so I'm a big advocate. And I feel like we have one chance, right, at staying mm -hmm. healthy as long as possible. And my mom was a good example of that. There's no reversing it, right? Once you're sick, there, that's it. You, it's a band-aid treatment after that. If you have a disease that even has a treatment, if it's Alzheimer's, it's not, it's a death sentence. So let's say you don't have Alzheimer's, but you know, you've, whether you've gone for an MRI or you've done some testing with another, just testing with your doctor, some sort of mental test with your doctor, and you feel that your brain has begun to atrophy, which again, that's a normal part of aging too. Can we reverse any of that or is it just stopping there? Because I, I, I mean, I've heard that there's not, we can't really reverse it, but then I know there has been, haven't there been a, stud, a couple studies recently that show that there are some things that we can do to improve where we're at? If it's mild cognitive impairment there, yeah, we're starting to think that we might be able to, but then it means taking it really seriously. Like you can't just say, oh, I'm just not going to have like fast food anymore. It means right. overhauling your diet, overhauling your lifestyle. Um, a lot of supplementing. We need much higher doses of omega threes than, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. in the standard supplements, um, higher doses of vitamin D. Uh, we need a lot of ingredients that are going to reduce inflammation and address stressors in the body and, you know, that are antioxidant. So it, it often means handfuls of pills in a day. It's not just, you know, taking your multivite and some vitamin D. It's usually more than that to truly reverse cognitive decline of any mm -hmm. sort. I think once it progresses beyond that, I'm not sure if there's much we can do, to be honest. We don't know that yet. It's pretty in line with what I thought. I just, I just, I'm, I'm always a little more hopeful that maybe there's something else out there that has shown that we can reverse. Yeah, the problem is the drugs that they've come out with to date for Alzheimer's are addressing the wrong thing. And we know mm -hmm. that now that there's been millions of dollars poured into addressing the amyloid plaques. And those are not what cause Alzheimer's. They're just a symptom of right. or it's what right. expressed in Alzheimer's. But the problem is the latest drugs that have all been fast tracked by the FDA all address amyloid plaques. So they're still, you know, barking up the wrong tree right now. And they're showing that it might slow the progression maybe. But again, once you have a parent or a loved one who's suffering that much, what I, in my opinion, I wouldn't want to slow that disease. It's not, they're not living a life at all. It's mm -hmm. terrible quality of life. So what are we slowing it for? And then there's a lot of side effects with the newer, the newer IV meds that came out in the last year or two. So, um, you know, unfortunately right now, no, we don't. I think we have to have a very different angle that we're addressing Alzheimer's from. And I don't think we're quite there yet. Yeah. Which I guess just also points to prevention earlier on. Yeah. And because we know that, you know, those changes in the brain can start happening 15, 20 years in advance. Like this is something we need to be thinking about when we're young, but this is the problem. It's like what you said about perimenopause. If you yeah. don't have the symptoms, we're not worried. We think we're invincible, right? Until, until right. we suddenly are like, oh my goodness, this is terrible. Now I have right. to do something. Different. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, yeah, you're talking to someone in their 30s about about this or in their 20s about this, yeah. and you should do X, Y, and Z because it'll prevent Alzheimer's in the future. I mean, they're thinking, most of, most people at that age are thinking, how can I lose 10 pounds right now? Or how yes. can I, you know, how can I yeah. have a little bit better energy? Or I want to, yeah. you know, eat for pregnancy or whatever. I mean, people obviously have more serious concerns than that too, but they're generally not thinking that far into the future. No, and no. It, it's something that needs to be talked about more because 
prevention does start a lot earlier on. Let's say you had a 25 year old who would be completely compliant and you said, and they said, give me three things to focus on to prevent Alzheimer's in the future and to live optimally. What would be those three things? Assuming that person would be completely compliant with whatever you said, what would you say? And then I want to ask you the same thing for someone, let's say in their fifties, starting to feel a little brain foggy, tired, irritable, what would be the Mm -hmm. three most important things you would tell them to do? I think in your 20s, um, because you probably don't have sleep issues yet, you probably are still sleeping quite well. Um, you probably don't have a lot of the inflammation and you know some of those underlying symptoms that we start to see as we age. I would say it's diet because you can never start too soon to be eating properly and protecting mm-hmm. your brain. Um, I think activity, and again, like I said, it doesn't have to be hitting the gym seven days a week. It's just stay active, be moving, because when we look at some of the longest living populations, they just move, they walk a lot, Mm -hmm. they're not sedentary. And I think find joy. Because Mm -hmm. I think when you're happy, you tend to make great choices. And we also it that reduces stress, it just it, it can be so healing, I think when you find the reason you love yourself and the things you love to do that are just for you. And I think that's something that women don't at all. Yeah. I love that. So diet, movement, and joy when you're in your 20s. Those are the three things to focus on for prevention of disease in the future. I love that. Love that. Okay. So now someone, let's say, in their 50s, feeling a little brain foggy, irritable, wanting to feel better. Hey, what should, like, what would you recommend if they're going to be compliant? You have, and like, what are the three top things you would recommend for them? Yeah. So that's harder, right? Narrowing it yeah. down to three at this point. Okay. You could say five. You could say five okay. things for that. <laughs> we're we're a lot more work in this stage of yeah. life. <laughs> well, it's harder, right? Because now we're reversing things that are happening in our body, which is harder. So I think I would say the same three that we, I would tell a, a young woman, I would say mm-hmm. to a more mature woman, right? That I think, again, find joy because we stop, right? We, we prioritize mm-hmm. everyone else but ourselves. And I think finding joy can be not only, you know, finding a hobby that you love to do, but it can be like meditating, journaling, whatever is bringing you inner peace, I think. And that mm-hmm. also, like, like I said, will reduce your stress levels. Um, diet, exercise, obviously, those are always a given. And then I think it becomes increasingly imperative to supplement because I think we need to be getting probiotics and our vitamin D and all of the nutrients that we need and anti-inflammatories and, you know, that whole gamut. So definitely supplementing. And then the next big one I would say is prioritize your sleep because I think our sleep hygiene goes down the toilet as we age, whether it's because we're stressed or because our hormones are gone are, you know, gone and we just have very disrupted, disjointed sleep. Um, that can lead to a lot of issues and you know whether and can in, increase all the symptoms that you're already feeling so i think sleep hygiene becomes incredibly important as we age i love all of these i love this because, and these are all, all things that are you know part of a nutritious life and living a nutritious life which is what this podcast yeah. is all about the pillars yes. of a nutritious life that all work together and i love that you said joy also because I always choose a word for the year that I'm going to zone in on. That's going to be my word. I think many people do that. And my word of 2024 is joy, just having a little more fun. So I love that you said that. Cause like, I yeah. just, I just need to have a little more fun, just a little more fun. I know. A, little a little more, more about fun. myself. Like I get stressed out about dumb things. Right. And just, I worry too much about things that are, you know, inconsequential when you look back. Yeah. So right. I think, yeah, just, I think finding that joy and inner peace is very, very important. Yeah. And, and having a little bit of joy every day. Cause like there's, there's yes. always going to be things going on and there's always going to be yeah. reasons to stress. And there's always, it seems like there's always going to be crazy things going on in the world, but if you're here and you're living and like, like you've got to live and you've got to find joy. So, so uh, I'm really glad that you said that. And then the other one I want to touch on a little more supplements because I love my supplements. I'm a big, I'm, <laughs> listen, I'm a nutritionist. I'm a dietitian. Obviously I focus on food. I mean, that mm-hmm. should go without saying we want to have our healthy diets, but there are things yeah. that we can do to, again, maximize our health, maximize the nutrients that we're getting in our in uh, in on a daily basis. I said, I have certain supplements I take in the morning. I have supplements for my nighttime routine to help with my sleep hygiene. So I love all of that. I mean, and I do take many specific for brain health from citicoline to my Mm -hmm. omega-3s to lutein to NAD. I mean, I 
I, I've got a whole routine. And I know not yeah. everyone is going to do that. And this is what I do. And I enjoy doing that. But I'm curious. First of all, I, I know that you also have your own supplement company. So I want to hear about that. But I, I also want to hear like, what are your, what are your top go-to supplements for, again, it is individual. It would always be individual, but for the average, let's say woman in her 40s or 50s, like what are your top supplements to at least check out to see if they're right for you? Yeah. So I think unless you have, you know, a, a serious medical condition, in which case you have to be more careful, the supplement line that I ended up creating, which really stemmed from I kind of had a system like you going on where I was taking like a gamut of different things that I wanted to take for me. It was, I was focusing a lot on brain health. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, a lot of what you have to do to protect your brain is the same as protecting yourself during perimenopause, right? It's, it was right. addressing, right. It, addressing inflammation and taking enough vitamin D, omega threes, you know, all of that. So I'm taking handfuls of pills every day and trying to source them from the right place because it's also finding the right dose, right? A lot of the grocery store brands, they're too low dose. You don't get mm -hmm. enough um, of certain ingredients. We just need higher levels. And then you have to take three or four of each. So now you're taking handfuls. And then I couldn't take everything I wanted in a day. Um, so the supplement system that I created was meant to be, it's its a whole system. It, they, it, the ingredients are now all being sold separately because I feel like women should get to choose right. what they want to address. But I originally created it to be a kit um, because I think there's no one that can't benefit from addressing all of their risk factors. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what um, Essentials is what I called it, is doing where there's, you know, things like berberine and Ceylon cinnamon in there, which help balance blood mm -hmm, sugar. Mm -hmm. Adequate doses of take, vitamin D. You know, take berberine and, also. <laughs> yes. I don't, and, I don't, I don't take cinnamon, but I do sprinkle it on many times throughout the day. But it has to be food. Ceylon cinnamon yes, to yes. actually, yeah, to yeah. give that, which a lot of the supplements are not, right? right? So it's like, what ingredient is it? Is it the right dose? Um, and then there's also like the stomach upset factor of it, right? Mm -hmm. When you start taking pills, so I enteric coated them. Um, so it's 48 ingredients that I blended down into 14 tablets and capsules that are spread out over the day, which when you go from taking 20 or 30 down to only three or four at a time, that's a huge difference to mm -hmm. get that many ingredients in as, and so then there's less fillers. Um, it's just, I wanted it to make it as simple. Really it was for me, it was selfishly that I was like, this is something I would want for myself mm -hmm. for my brain health. And, you know, just by fortuitous nature, it also supports a lot of the perimenopausal symptoms, right? So it addresses sleep and gut health. There's a probiotic in it. Um, it's got all your B vitamins and, you know, your CoQ10 for heart health and um, seven functional mushrooms. So now we're addressing immunity and brain health and energy and fatigue and brain fog. Um, so it's there's not much I didn't touch on. Um, but I, you know, I recognize that, like you said, not everything is for everyone. So I did make it that, you know, you can purchase whatever you want if you, if you like. But I think women need to be thinking about it, even if they're just getting a few things like one adaptogen to reduce their stress levels, a turmeric to ad address inflammation and pain, um, you know, their vitamin D, their omega threes. I think that's a good place for women to start a good probiotic okay. for gut health, right? Right. Um, yeah, we didn't talk enough about gut health. We're going to have to have you back on to talk specifically <laughs> about gut health and how that affects the brain as well. Yes. I love I love the gut brain conversation as well. We'll um we'll do, we'll do another another episode on that for sure. Yes, um, definitely. And and we'll also include in the show notes where people can find your specific supplements. So okay. everyone listening, uh, we'll make sure we put that in the show notes. So check that out so you can find Kavita's supplements. Um, thank you. But that was a great. That was a great short list to get people started. Yeah. I like that. Two more questions for you. One, we didn't, I want, we, I introduced you at the beginning of the podcast and I gave a little bit of your backstory, but I'd love for people to hear that from you. You went from being a farm D to now having the supplement company to, I know you've had met different clinics throughout the years. So mm -hmm. can you just give us the story of you? Yeah. So, yeah. So clinical pharmacist worked in the hospital for years. And then I owned my own multidisciplinary clinic where we were addressing a lot of chronic illnesses. And one of the largest po populations uh -oh. that we saw at that clinic was women with fibromyalgia. And when women are diagnosed with fibro, like it's a, it's a devastating um, disease state where it, it's, you know, gives you body wide pain. It's neuro, it's neuropathic. So often underdiagnosed and dismissed. A lot of women are told that they're just making it up. 
Um, and then these women also just happen to be in their perimenopausal years. So there's probably a hormonal connection there too, but they end up with a lot of sleep issues, gut dysbiosis. So very similar to what we talk about when we talk about perimenopause, but it's amplified. Like the, you know, the amount of pain that these women feel is quite significant. And it was around that same time that my mom was actually diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. So again, she's a perimenopausal woman who now has this devastating disease. So that's kind of what put me on the path to, you know, studying more about brain health, women's health, um, and the correlation between women's health and some of these chronic diseases that we tend to, you know, get more than men. And, you know, it was around the time she passed away during COVID then that I was like, you know, it's one thing to just know about it and understand it and to talk about it in passing and in, in my career, but I wanted to actually do something about it. So, which is when I founded Revival. Um, which the supplements were just the first phase. It's really a women's health company. Um, we're launching our health hub in February, which is going to be, yeah, which is a portal where women can log in. We have um, an AI based survey system that women can use to determine their risk factors for brain health um, or, for, you know, for cognitive decline um, and also learn where they rank on a scoring system for menopausal symptoms. And then we'll be giving, you know, it'll deliver reports to women with lots of education, things that they can do, questions they can ask their physician, what are lifestyle changes that they can make? And are there any diagnostics that they should be considering, right? If there's something more concerning. And then hopefully that will also be bringing in um, some telemedicine. That was that would be my goal is to, to bring in the ability for women to actually see women's health physicians and discuss their options for uh, hormone replacement in a kind of a telemedicine um, system. So that's kind of where we're headed. Um, oh, that's and how amazing. I, so we'll put in, yeah. we'll put all that information in the show notes as well. That's incredible. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's time, right? That if we all kind of start addressing it, hopefully slowly, it will become, it'll become more widespread that women can actually get the care that they need. Yeah, absolutely. From from your mouth, <laughs> from, <laughs> from your mouth to God's ears, let's uh, let let's make that all happen. Uh, women yes. should certainly get all women, all women, right? Uh, all over yes. the globe should get all of the care that they need. My last question for you. So you know the podcast name is Living a Nutritious Life, and a nutritious mm -hmm. life is all about all of these different pillars that all work together, as I say, physiologically and behaviorally, and from sleep to stress to to, lo to the love more pillar. I want to know from you, what is the one thing that you do on a daily basis to live your most nutritious life? What's that one thing that sets living a nutritious life in motion for you? For me, it is getting outside every single morning. So I think I have a motivator, well, two motivators. We have uh, two golden doodles. And okay. so I think we ever since we got them four years ago, we've walked almost every single day, barring any, you Incredible. know, incredible weather. Yeah, and I think it makes such a big difference because not only is it just great exercise, but it's also good for them. And it's getting out in nature is incredible for your mood, seeing sunshine. Absolutely. Sunlight, yep, yeah. absolutely. Yes, it's imperative for mood, especially this time of year as we're going into, you know, shorter days. Um, it's stressful around the holidays. So I think for me, that's made a huge difference. And I can tell when I go, several days without getting that walk in, even if it's just 15, 20 minutes, I try to do more, yeah. but even if it's just a short one, it makes an incredible difference. And I would encourage women to take that time. And it's that also, it can be 15, 20 minutes just to yourself, yeah. right? which is incredible too. Well, and it's important even for your circadian rhythm. So bringing it even back yeah. to sleep, it's important to get yeah. that sunlight in the morning. So that's yeah. amazing. I love yeah. that. Thank you so much. All right. So we're going to have to have you back on. We're going to have to talk about gut health and the connection Absolutely. to brain health. Um, love that conversation as well, but this was so informative. Loved hearing from you. Thank you so much. All of Kavita's information will be in the show notes. So everyone check that out. And thank you so much again for being here. Thank you. Thank you.